recording. Uh, we are in Genesis 26, which has to do with a famine. So we're studying the life of Jacob with Luther, and Genesis 26 is sort of a skip. It's, it's more talking about the life of Isaac. So we're just sort of moving quickly uh, through this particular chapter. Um, but we, we want to we do want to pay attention to it because it's teaching us a little bit about um, how Luther reads the scriptures. So this is uh, the famine in the land beside the former famine that was in the land. There's going to be a later famine in the land. So Abraham had a famine. Isaac has a famine. Remember, Jacob and Joseph have the big famine, the seven-year famine with the seven skinny cows and seven fat cows, in, and, and that's the whole business in Egypt there. These famines are coming over and over in the land, and, um, and it's not something to miss. I mean, probably very few of us have lived through a famine, and you, you got to imagine what that would be like, you know, just to, to know that the land isn't producing and that food is scarce and that you're eating just enough to stay alive and so forth. And, and Luther is going to hone in on that famine. He's going to, Luther's going to see in the famine, the difference between what he will, he, he will, well, let me, I'll tell you a story. I remember one time I went to see someone, they were getting ready for surgery. And so they weren't eating. They had to fast for 24 hours. And they said, uh, and I said, oh, you're fasting. And they said, pastor, that doesn't count. The doctor told me I can't eat. Uh, I'm not doing it because I want to. And I told them that, this, that Luther makes this point uh, about fasting that it's the fasting that we don't choose that's the real fasting. When the spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness, that's a true fast. When you don't have food to eat, that's a true fast. If you choose your, your fasting, I mean, it's fine. And we fast during Lent. We choose not to, to eat this meal or not to eat this thing or not to eat meat on, on Fridays or whatever. Or you, we can choose our fast. But the point is, if you choose your fast, you can also break your fast. If you choose not to eat, then you can also make the choice to go to the refrigerator and get a quesadilla. Uh, I, I'm doing my Lent up early, but I have to tell you, I was on a retreat on Friday night and it was a rough night. And so I did not wake up early because I, I was choo I'm choosing it. But, but Luther makes the point is that the real fast is the one that the Lord lays on you. The real fast is a famine. I I found the quote about that. I got my box of where I try to keep this stuff. I'll, I'll look for that here too. But Luther is now going to contrast this. Um, uh, is it not here? Fasting? It should be in the fasting section. No, I'll never find it. So, uh, so the, um, uh, the, the contrast of the piety of Isaac with the piety of the monks. And this is going to be Luther's contrast the whole time, is that the monks have a self-chosen piety. They've chosen whatever it is. They've chosen uh, obedience and chastity and um, poverty. They've chosen it for themselves. And they think, I've attained this higher piety. But Luther's going to make this just very precise, that this, the, the cross is what the Lord gives to us. The true cross is not our self-chosen cross, our self-chosen affliction, but rather the affliction that the Lord lays upon us. I got a question here. Do I have a Rolodex of Luther quotes? No, I have a Rolodex of just thoughts that I want to remember. And sometimes Luther makes it into my little Rolodex there. Uh, he did today. I put one in there. But normally it's just ideas I want to remember. Okay. So here we are uh, in, in Luther on... Um, on the text here. Therefore, let us learn to enlarge upon and elucidate the accounts of the patriarchs in opposition to the monstrosities of the hypocrites and the monks who maintain that to have a wife and children is a voluptuous life, and that for this reason it cannot be devout or saintly. 
So here's the here's the argument of the monks who Luther here calls hypocrites. And he says, you can if you have a wife and children, if you haven't taken a vow of chastity, then you have a life of ease and it can't be devout or saintly. Consider whether all the opportunities for joy and pleasure have not been cut off for Isaac, since he was uncertain every hour where to set his foot. He wandered around, etc. Not one of the monks will imitate this. Indeed, they live a truly blessed life in this world, a life that abounds in pleasures. They have excellent houses, they're under the protection of the Pope, and they rule over the world. In other words, Luther says, you want to you wanna see an aesthetic life of suffering and affliction? And you don't look at the monks. They got it easy. Uh, Luther, Luther would talk about this all the time. And he, he knows of what he speaks. I mean, Jesus, uh, uh, when he sets us to love our neighbor, he is... He's not giving us the authority to try to remove ourselves from the difficulties of the messiness of this life. Um, Paul says, explain Jesus saying, take up your cross. Jesus, he commands it to, for us to take up the cross. This is a good point. Jesus, the life following after Jesus is the life of the cross. So we are not choosing a life of ease, but rather we're following after Jesus and all the afflictions uh, that will come upon him. So I think the cross there is the discipleship of following Jesus. And as we follow him, he appoints our crosses. I think that's at least the way I respond to it. Therefore, this wandering of Isaac puts to shame all the religious practices of the papists. And in him, the highest form of worship shines. And what's that? The highest form of worship? We know the answer. Faith in God. God desires to be worshiped this way that we believe his promises and receive the gifts that he gives so that the true worship of God. And, and this is one of these basic reformation principles. It'll come up over and over and over beautifully. And that is that true worship is faith. We, we always want to change that, right? We always want true worship to be our works. That's how we want to worship God. But the true worship is faith. There's a line in the Book of Concord, a couple of lines like this that talk about, um, how do they say it? There's the worship of the law and the worship of the gospel. And God desires to be worshiped this way that we believe his promises so that the worship of the gospel is faith. The worship of the law is works. And I suppose we worship God in both ways, but this is the highest form of worship. He travels about, this is Jacob, he travels about with his whole household it has no fixed dwelling place, no pasture land. He doesn't have a drop of water. Someone else would say, where am I to get them? He answers, I believe in God the Father. For Isaac thought like this, God will provide for me a dwelling place as I travel about. He will give pasture lands for my cattle and will provide food and drink for my domestics. Thus, Isaac makes the highest sacrifice of faith every day of his life and lives in the world without the world and outside the world. Oh, that's beautiful, actually. You see, Isaac is in the world, and yet he is, he is not, how do, we used to say this, say it like this, Isaac is in the world, but not of the world. He lives in the world, true enough, he walks around. You can go and see where he lived, but he is without the world. He doesn't have all the riches and glory of the world. And he is, in fact, outside the world. He lives in the kingdom of God. He lives by faith. Paul says it like this in Galatians. He says, that I have been crucified with, with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live for the Son of God who gave himself up for me. About this faith, this trust in God for everything, which is very great in the Father's. The godless are not concerned. They only look at the little wife, the domestics, the cattle. So they look at, they read Isaac and they say, Isaac, he was a farmer. He was a husband. He was a dad. He can't be, he can't be this holy. The faith which supports and preserves all this, they do not see. 
If in our time someone to roam about this manner, he would not be able to have manservants or maidservants who would follow him as he traveled about. You can imagine this is kind of like Don Quixote who had his, what was his little armor bearer who followed him around? And you're like, you must be as crazy as him if you're going to follow him around. But so Luther says, you, you go wander around like Isaac, you're not going to have anybody. You're not going to be able to hire anybody. But faith works wonders. It brings it about that the domestics endure such great misfortune, trials, and poverties with equanimity uh, and show themselves obedient in all things. So even the um, manservants and maidservants, the workers who are serving Isaac, stick with them. I certainly would be unable to acquire such upright servants, for I do not have such great faith. <laughs> Nor can any of the saints of the New Testament, I think this means, by the way, uh, church. So I'm not talking about Peter or Paul, but talking about the people since then. Achieve this greatness of the virtues of these fathers. Now let's just pause there for a brief second and, and notice the underlying sort of um, the underlying respect that Luther has for Isaac. That is key here. And it shouldn't and it shouldn't be missed that he he knows that Isaac is a sinner. He knows that Jacob is a sinner. He knows these things. But he really honors them for their faith and their trust in the Lord. And this is something that's given to us in the scriptures. We talked last time about Hebrews chapter 11, which goes through all of these saints in the Old Testament, all of these old fathers and honors them. Why? Because of their faith. In comparison with them, they, and under, we can write here, we are simply little children and infants. They, and here now we're talking about the monks, have no sanctity whatever except their celibacy. But Isaac's wandering surpasses this too. Indeed, his marriage is far more excellent than all the celibacy of the monks, just as the light of the sun is brighter than any candle. So that, so that Luther is here um, recognizing the virtue and the honor of the work that the Lord has appointed. Now here, here we can see, and, and just maybe to make the, the kind of general Reformation point, is that mm, there's always a tendency to sort of build, we, ha we have the Lord's life, the creation and the life in creation that the Lord has given us. There's always a temptation to, to build a alternative route to holiness so it, the pharisees had their alternative route with all their laws and all their customs and all their traditions and everything like this and the catholic church has its own routes evangelical church has its own route the lutherans are tempted we to create our own route every one of us is to have our own alternative route to righteousness or holiness which has to do with um, well, to remember to do that, you have to, you have to minimize the 10 commandments and then build something up on top of it. So your the requirement of the 10 commandments, which require everything, all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength that has to be diminished to some sort of outward keeping of the law. Like. You should not physically commit murder, physically commit adultery. You have to take away the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, if you think or say or speak in this way, you've broken these commandments. You have to minimize the Ten Commandments, and then you can build up your own sort of standards on top of it. That's, the, that's our sort of religious instinct. And so it was, the, and Luther's just going right after that with the monks. They had their own route to holiness, which was their vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And Luther says, look, the Lord is going to sort this stuff out and he's going to give us our lives. Uh, it's not up to us to choose these things. Self-chosen holiness versus God-appointed holiness. Therefore, their entire life abounds in miracles, for they live simply from the hand of God on almost nothing. Talking about the patriarchs. They are dependent on the kindness and promises of God and hold firmly to this hope. If I have nothing today and do not see what I shall live on, I shall surely get it tomorrow or on the day after tomorrow. <laughs> I 
tomorrow or maybe the next day. Virtues of this kind should be carefully taken into consideration in the account of Isaac. But above all, the fact uh, that he is filled with faith in God who cherishes and supports him. So what does God do? God loves Isaac and God helps Isaac. And Isaac knows it. Ah, it's great. He undoubtedly accustomed his heart to patience, gentleness, and kindness toward his neighbor. Can we grab a hold of this language? To accustom the heart, the habit of the heart becomes patience, patience, gentleness, kindness toward his neighbor. He learned to bear wrongs, whether done to himself or to his household. He did not quarrel out of hatred and a desire for vengeance. For the saintly fathers were hospitable, compassionate, and kind toward friends and enemies alike. Because in them there shone an outstanding faith, which produces such excellent virtues. Now note this well, that what comes first? Faith. And what follows? Virtues. It's just fantastic. About these virtues, the sophists, this is the, uh, we say sophistry. So the disputers, this is kind of the, the scholastic disputing of the Middle Ages that, that grew out of the tradition of Thomas Aquinas, but just expanded. Well, Thomas Aquinas was part of it. It just expanded in the Middle Ages of all of these debates and things like that. Uh, these virtues of the sophists dispute ineptly in a godless manner, whether they are commandments or counsels. And they conclude that they are only councils. The, uh, this is an interesting thing. Um, Sorbonists, I don't know who this is, but it must be named after a guy named Sorbon. That'd be my guess there. Say that people can be saved even though they have shown no kindness toward one another. The monastic life is indeed of that kind, namely only an outward hypocrisy, which disregards these virtues as though they were merely counsels. So, okay, so this dispute between commandments and counsels is really quite something and, um, and has to do with uh, the medieval theology of the Catholic Church, but also Luther's, um, Luther's own discovery of the gospel. Okay, so, so, here, so here's the idea coming out of the Middle Ages, and here's why Luther's so worked up about it. What is righteousness? Uh, the idea in the Middle Ages was that you had the righteousness of the law, which, which was the Ten Commandments. And then, but this is understood externally. Uh, so by not um, committing adultery, by not murdering, etc., I'm the I'm keeping the Ten Commandments. And this is for everyone. But then they understood the righteousness of the gospel to be what they called the uh, evangelical councils. Is it CI or SE? Mm, Let's go with this. I can't remember which one. So evangelical councils. And this had to do with like the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus says, um, you shall not commit adultery, I say you shall not lust. When Jesus says you shall not murder, I say you shall not be angry. And they understood that these were uh, an, an extra burden that the Lord was putting on you. And to get to and to keep that extra burden, you would take the vow of the of the monks and that vow was threefold poverty so you removed yourself from economic life and from the state and chastity which removed yourself from marriage or from the home and uh obedience which removed yourself also from the family because your obedience and, and the state as well. Because when you took the vow of obedience, you are not promising to be obedient to your parents or to the governing authorities. You were promising to be obedient to the monastic rule. So you were, 
you are exempting yourself from all these sorts of things. So you have, on the one hand, you have the normal Christian who lives over here and probably needs a lot of forgiveness because they're doing all these external things, but they're sinning all the time. And then you have the super Christian that has made this vow. And now they're, they're actually the righteous ones. They have the righteousness of the gospel. And so they're doing good works and they're not only doing good works for themselves, but they're doing extra good works. They're doing works of super irrigation, they called it. So that now they can, through their, through their monastic vows, they can have a righteousness that will save themselves and also that can be applied to people over here. And so, so the, the idea is, well, Isaac, you know, Isaac and Jacob, they lived this kind of life. They didn't have the vow of poverty, of chastity and obedience. They weren't part of the evangelical councils, the very righteous ones. They, he, they lived over here. And so the monks and all of these who were the super righteous uh, live over here and despise everyone who lives over there. Well, Luther was over here. He took the monastic vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. He joined the Augustinian order precisely for this reason. He could save himself and manage to maybe help everybody else. The extra good works, they called them the works of, um, they called them super erogation. The, the, the works above and beyond what you even need for your own salvation, those are applied up into the treasury of merit and those, the treasury of merit can then be applied through the sacramental life of the church to the, to the normal folks. Astonishing. So Luther talks about this when, um, when he's discussing his discovery of the gospel. He says, uh, I was taught that the righteousness of the law was that obedience of the Ten Commandments and that the righteousness of the gospel was the even stricter law required in the, Ten Com in the, um, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. So that the, the Ten Commandments were like a weight. And then the gospel was another weight. It's as if someone gave you a backpack with 10 bricks in it. And they said, but I've got some good news. And then they said, here's 10 more bricks. <laughs> and Luther says, as he's met, he's because he's trying to do it. He's trying to keep all these commandments. He says, I hated that word. This is hard for us to hear. But I hated that word, the righteousness of God. And I hated the God who commanded such righteousness. This is all in um, Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the righteousness of God for those who believe, for the Jew first and then for the Greek. But then he says, I paid attention to the context. And I realized that this righteousness of the gospel is the righteousness of faith. From faith to faith, for those who believe. And if that's the case, if righteousness is a matter of faith and not of works, then this gospel must be a promise. Does that make sense? The, the way you keep a commandment is by doing it. The way you keep a promise is by believing it. And so if the way we get this righteousness is by faith, then that must be a promised righteousness, not a commanded righteousness. In other words, that this righteousness is a gift a free gift by God's grace. And that makes all the difference. So then you see what happens. If the gospel, if the righteousness of the gospel is a gift, then all of this stuff, all of this evangelical counsel and all of this, it's, it's either one of two things. It's obviously not the righteousness of the gospel. It can't be that. So it either has to be part of the Ten Commandments, which the Lord requires for everybody, or it has to be sham hypocrisy that the Lord does not uh, uh, require. Right? And so what is Jesus, when Jesus says that you should not murder, that means you shouldn't be angry, you should not look with lust, that's, that, that is included in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not only external, but they also deal with the heart. But all of this monastic vow stuff is a sham righteousness. And, and here's the point of it all, it's offensive to the gospel. If I can be righteous by, by my own works and efforts, by taking these vows, by doing these works, then the cross of Jesus is of no effect. 
it's unneeded. It's unnecessary. I can do it on my own. So this is this profound. So, so Luther's understanding of the, of the hypocrisy of monasticism is bound up to his discovery of the gospel and the very purpose of Jesus dying on the cross. And so now you, you can see when he's reading this life of Isaac and how that normal domestic life of Isaac and Jacob, how that was despised by the monks, it gets him worked up into a fury because, because it's assaulting Jesus. Every heresy strikes at Christ, says Luther. Okay. Uh, got it? Okay. A couple more highlights here. Uh, but one should note this, first of all, and, I'm, and my idea here is to crank through as much Luther as I can on this chapter, because I want to start with chapter 27 next week. One should note, first of all, that commonly when the word is flourishing and the Lord gives abundance of spiritual food, physical hunger soon threatens. <laughs> For the devil takes away the sustenance of the church and wants to kill it off with hunger. You wonder why the church is always fighting about budget stuff. I mean, not always, but almost always, it seems like there's never going to be enough. Well, the devil hates the church. Uh, the devil hates us. The devil's always, if he can't take away the word, he takes away the bread. This surely must have been an extraordinary famine uh, here in Genesis 26. Moses compares it to the earlier famine, which occurred at the time of Abraham. So now it's almost completely disappeared from memory. Meanwhile, approximately 100 or more years have elapsed. Therefore, Moses recalls the earlier famine to compare it to the present one in order to point out the extreme scarcity of the distress. But how does it come that such saintly people did not obtain from God the food that was necessary for themselves or for others? For not only Abraham and Isaac, but also other very eminent patriarchs and prophets, Jacob, Joseph, Elijah, Elisha, eventually even Paul, other godly man, men, not to mention Job, poor old Job, had to endure the general disaster of famine together with others. My answer, are you curious what Luther says here? My answer is that God sends famine, wars, pestilence, and similar disasters in the first place to try and to test the godly in order that they may learn to maintain with assurance that they will be nourished even in time of famine, even though they are forced to experience various difficulties in addition to look for unknown and uncertain dwelling places. So the first reason the Lord sends famine is as a test. The Lord doesn't tempt anybody, but the Lord does test us. And what's the test? Will you believe in God? Will you believe that the Lord provides for you when there's no provision? Will you believe that your sins are forgiven when you see only sin? Will you trust in the promise of eternal life when all you see is death? In the second place, he does this in order to offend and punish the ungodly. So famine comes as a gift to the church, but as punishment to the ungodly. For when the word has been abundantly revealed, the people become ungrateful and they persecute and they hate the word. This is a, um, this is a really kind of curious point that it is harder to believe when things are good than when things are bad it's also have you i was trying to i was meditating on this the other day that it's harder to watch someone suffer than to actually suffer so that like the more how like the, the nicer things are in a culture, the more the people problem, the more the people complain about the problem of suffering. Like if you, and I don't know if it's just because if you're in the midst of suffering, you just don't have time to worry about it. But it's a curious thing. I mean, you, you, when, you, when you go to the hospital room, the people who are suffering more are not the people in the bed, but the people sitting in the chairs around them. I don't know exactly why, but when you're hungry, 
when you're hungry, your hunger is not an argument against God, but for God. But when you're watching someone who's hungry, their hunger is an argument against God. Do you know what I'm talking about? It was when I got sick a couple of years ago, it was so much harder for Carrie and for my kids than it was for me. It was great for me. Strange. So the, so the difficulty comes here uh, in the midst of suffering uh, to test us and to punish the ungodly. Uh, there's a, I think that Luther is pulling this, by the way. Well, I don't know if he's pulling it, but you can see the exact same argument in St. Augustine's On the City of God. Remember he, uh, remember um, the, the Rome collapsed and they blamed the Christians and Augustine writes his big apologetic that it wasn't the Christians. And he says the same thing. Affliction comes as a gift to the Christian and as punishment to the wicked. Eric asks, what's the difference between suffering and pain? Uh, Dr. Schultz has a great explanation to this, and it's re really quite nice. If you haven't seen some of those conversations I had with Dr. Schultz, uh, those are really good. Uh, maybe someone can put a link up there, but he talks about how animals can suffer pain, but suffering is the awareness of pain. And suffering is that cry of no, that shout of no against pain. So if the pain is physical or if the pain is spiritual or the pain is emotional or whatever, it's our own awareness of that pain. Maybe that's the way to say it. Suffering is the awareness of pain, the consciousness of pain, and that it shouldn't be this way. Um, where'd we go? Is this the right spot? The others who seem to accept it become disgusted with and sick of this very unimportant food. They despise and harass its ministers. What's Luther talking about? With contempt and hatred, they provoke the wrath of God. So he says, oh, I got it. The food here is the food of the Lord's word. Um, and so people despise it. And they harass pastors or people who are bringing the word of God. And so God's wrath is provoked. And he says, if you don't want to be satisfied with spiritual food and life, I'll take it away from you, even the physical life, and I'll kill you with famine. This is Jesus who says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then these things will be added to you. But if you seek first the other things, then everything is lost. Consequently, through the neglect of the incalculable treasure, they lose the advantages even of the present life. And just as the godly are preserved, so the godless are overwhelmed by misfortunes and despair. And since they are without the word, they're slain. I think this is a really um, helpful thing to note that hmm, that if you do not have the Lord's word, you are off balance in the world. Everything is very tenuous. You're on a tightrope. I mean, think about it. If you do not believe in Jesus and the promise of life everlasting and the resurrection of the body, then you're just one heartbeat away from oblivion. It's like walking. Can you imagine? This is probably why Paul says that the, the Gentiles are without hope in the world. Could you imagine that your whole life you're just walking on the edge of a cliff? It just And it goes down and it goes down a mile. It's just dark. You can't even see the bottom of the pit. You're just walk, and every moment you're right on the edge of that pit and a person, a, a gust of wind pushes you over. That, I mean, that's what that line of life and death is for the unbeliever. For us, you know, I mean, Jesus is waiting to catch us. Someone pushes us over and we're like, finally, <laughs> Jesus catches us. But for the, for the unbeliever, it's just, you plummet into nothing. It's just, Anyway, the tenuous life. Okay. Satan, who is delight. Oh wait, 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 wait. Uh, Satan, Satan, who's delighted by this offense, seizes this upon this as a reason for slandering and disparaging the word of God, and turns it to his own advantage, in order to alienate the hearts of men from the world. So the devil sees the famine and all the trouble in the world, and the devil says, "I'll use it." 
<laughs> I'll take advantage of it. For what else shall we suppose the Canaanites thought? Before Abraham's arrival, they enjoyed such rich blessings of every kind, and now they were being compelled to endure hunger with Abraham. What, shall, what do we suppose they thought that this Chaldean was the cause of all the evils and disasters? Someone told me the other day, they said, you know, hey, things were pretty good here in Texas till you guys came. And then we had a pandemic and an ice storm and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> I'm not, I don't, but this is this is how Luther said this is how the Chaldeans. I, I put myself as Abraham in that picture. I didn't mean to. That's not what I'm saying. This is the point is that that's how they thought about Abraham. Everything was great until this guy came along, brought the Lord's name. The second reason is this, that the devil and the godless may have opportunity to blaspheme the gospel. So that they become progressively worse. Just as today we're compelled everywhere to hear and bear similar complaints that in former times there were more abundant yields of everything and amazing good fortune. But now grain is costlier and everything is in far worse condition. Reformation inflation. Yet to me at least, this does not seem to result from a scarcity of products, rather from the greed and wickedness of the people who arbitrarily increase the price of things. Luther on economics. Nevertheless, it is not a light misfortune with which the poor and the ministers of the word are being hard pressed. The others who have an abundance of wealth have less trouble. Consequently, many long for the former state of affairs with its previous prosperity, and they add the blasphemy that nothing good has come from this doctrine of the gospel, and that in addition, both the inclinations of the people and their morals are far more corrupt than in times past. Thus, the doctrine of the gospel is blamed for every evil. Hey, look at this. This is the city of God. I, I forgot that this came up. When the Goths were laying Italy waste at the time of Augustine in Rome, the entire blame was put on the apostles, Peter and Paul. That's what uh, Augustine wrote the um, city of God, arguing against that. We should read the city of God together sometime. For wicked people, well, that's a long book, though. We also should, we are going to have to read Ignatius together sometime, but I don't know if we'll finish Luther on Jacob before the end of the world. Hope not. Wicked people remove from their eyes the sins of the world and the word of God, which is completely pure and holy, unjustly bears the blame for all crimes. For it does not teach usurpious or usurious practices, greed, luxury, and other misdeeds and frauds of the world, but it cries out and fights against all these sins. I think, by the way, we, we are, and I got to work on this a little bit, but, but uh, we preach a lot, yes, a lot less about greed and luxury and other sins of money and wealth than Luther and the Bible does. We've got to work on that. We, we, because we're in the midst of a sexual revolution, we're so honed in on the fifth commandment and the sixth commandment that we don't give enough time to the seventh commandment. My assessment. I'm talking mostly about myself. Why then is the gospel burdened with such atrocious slanders? Because of the wickedness of Satan, in which he delights, consists in bl blaspheming the gospel and heaping up abuses against it from all sides. Now we wonder why. So I say we have to talk more about the seventh commandment. Now I'm going to talk about the sixth commandment. We wonder why the church is blamed for all the ills of the world, how the church is considered haters, and we're the ones who are the intolerati. Well, the gospel is blamed for every evil. There you go. Okay. How are we doing on time? 440. Let me, let me just check here. Uh, how much? Uh, look at what I highlighted. That, 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 that. Uh, well, and that gets to chapter two. Uh, mm. Mm. Ah. Boy, oh boy. Well, let's, let's just, I'm just going to scroll down here a little bit, and that's where we'll start next time. <laughs> There's just too much. Okay, so let me mark it there, and then um, and we'll stop and uh, see if there's any questions we need to record answers to, and then we'll, we'll uh, stop the recording and jump on here. Uh, finish you. Uh, hours coming. Yes, Oliver says, the hour's coming when whoever kills you thinks he's offering God a service. And this is uh, Jesus reflecting on the same point, is that the trouble that the church experiences 
is understood as righteousness by those who are bringing it. The, the, the Romans who killed the martyrs thought that they were doing a good according to their office and their calling. They were helping the world. And those who are censuring Christians, I, I did this survey on people who are experiencing um, resistance to their Christian confession at work. I'm working on that. I'm supposed to be done with that essay this week. That, that the people who are, the people in HR who are doing all of the uh, pronoun training think that they're doing a good work, that they're acting in love. So that's right. Okay, let's summarize. Isaac has the righteousness of faith and he loves his neighbor and he lives with his wife and his kids through all sorts of affliction and that is good. We cannot improve on the Lord's estates. We cannot improve on the Lord's ordering of the world. And all our attempts to develop an alternate route to holiness, um, the Lord resists with his word. Because the one holiness that he wants us to have is the holiness of the forgiveness of sins that Jesus wins for us on the cross. That's the point. Okay, we'll pick up there uh, next week. Let's pray.